Excellencies, ministry, ministers, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. What an honor to see so many of you back at the GCSP. Welcome back. I wish we could gather together to discuss a topic that isn't as heavy as the one that we will be dealing with tonight. But the fact that you are here reminds us that the world is not indifferent to the humanitarian crisis that is unfolding in the very heart of Europe, which is reverberating across the world. Tonight, we are launching the third of our new GCSP Geneva debates. The Geneva security debates consist of public discussions on current security challenges. Each month, we will unite the world's leading thinkers and practitioners for interactive discussions. We hope that these Geneva security debates will inform our policymakers uh, with new insights, joint reflections, and networking. We hope that these debates will, will also shape us a better global future. This is a hybrid event, and we have approximately 90 people in the room and another 180 online. Tonight, we are fortunate to have a partner in launching this debate, the Konrad Adenauer Foundation. Without their collaboration, we would not have this eminent group of individuals that are sitting in front of you. Our distinguished panel is so eminent that they need but a short introduction. All three of our speakers have been influential leaders in politics, in domestic politics, foreign policy, security policy, uh, for, for decades. Let me first begin with Professor Dr. Lamert. He has been a parliamentarian for the German Bundestag since 1980, and he has been the president of the German Bundestag for 14 years. He is also the chairman of the Konrad Adenauer Foundation. Professor Dr. Lammert's tenure in office gained him respect across party lines as he was determined to uphold the honor and importance of the federal parliament, while at the same time displaying a dry sense of humor, and most notably in exchanges with the then chairman, Dr. Gregor Gysi. During his tenure as president, Professor Dr. Lammert eloquently referred to the German Bundestag as the beating heart of German democracy. Ambassador Professor Dr. Christoph Heusken has been a German ambassador to the United Nations in New York for the last three years. As Undersecretary for Foreign and Security Policy in the German Chancellery, he has also worked for 12 years and has been described as uh, Chancellor Angela Merkel's most influential foreign and security policy advisor. While working as director of the EU policy unit of the EU's High Representative Javier Solana, he drafted the first EU European security strategy in 2003. Ambassador Heusken now is the serving chairman of the Munich Security Conference, one of the most respected conferences in Europe, as well as a fellow of the Konrad Adenauer Foundation. Ambassador Thomas Greminger is a Swiss diplomat and the director of the GCSP. He was the former Secretary General of the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe from 2017 to 2020. In this capacity, he acted as an effective crisis manager supporting successive chairmanships in, in an increasingly polarized environment to promote dialogue among the 57 OSC participating states. He also worked on human security issues as head of the Human Security Division of the Swiss Federal Department of Foreign Affairs and later as Deputy Director General of the Swiss Agency for Development and Cooperation. For those of you who do not know me, I'm Christina Shori Liang. I lead the terrorism and PVE and organized crime work here at the GCSP within the Research and Policy, uh, Policy Unit. I am also a visiting professor at the Paris School of In International Affairs, Sciences Po. Our debate will consist of three parts. Our first part will impact, will discuss the war on diplomacy and multilateralism. Uh, on the second part, we will discuss national responses to the war in Ukraine, specifically Germany and Switzerland. Our third segment will, will be put in place. We will talk about the how to prevent the widening of the war and ultimately how 
best to broker a peace deal. As I'm sure most of you agree, this war will require our leaders, dip diplomats, and security establishment to find a delicate balance that blends determination with realism. To begin the discussion, some important numbers and statistics. The war has unleashed Europe's largest refugee crisis since World War II. Since Europe, more than 13 million people have been forced to flee their homes, according to the United Nations Refugee Agency. According to the International Organization from, of Migration, nearly 6.7 million people have been dispersed across Europe. Another 6.6 .6 million people are internally displaced within Ukraine. Those statistics point to the fact that nearly one third of Ukrainians no longer live in their proper homes. The IOM has found that those uh, who we are internally displaced, nearly half have no salary or income, and only one fourth have a proper house for the winter months ahead. Most Ukrainians who have fled the country are unac unaccompanied women and children, which has made them extremely vulnerable to human traffickers and organized crime. The Human Rights Office has documented nearly 5,600 civilians killed in Ukraine, but the numbers are much higher. It is very difficult to gauge exactly how many people have died, but it's in the tens of thousands. Tens of thousands of soldiers have also lost their lives in the war. And unfortunately, we do not have the exact figures. They're very hard to come by. The war has evolved into a humanitarian crisis, which has unleashed greater food and energy insecurity, especially in Europe, but also around the globe. It has raised questions about the architecture of global security. It is to this, the architecture of global security that we will now turn. So I will begin with my first question to Ambassador Hoiskin. In the past, diplomats in the foreign policy establishment helped to create the bedrock of global order through the creation of NATO, the UN, the OSCE, and the World Bank, which were meant to man maintain peace and security throughout Europe for all time. The Russian invasion of Ukraine has put into question that peace and the stability of Europe. Ambassador Hoiskin, for your opening remarks, do you think that the foundation of global security is still intact or is the global order fundamentally broken? Thank you. Well, first of all, thank you very much for having me. It's wonderful to be here at the GSSP and it's wonderful also to be with Thomas Gremminger again. Um, I've been working with him in different capacities over time. It's wonderful to be here and thanks for the, for the invitation. Um, Christina, on your question, um, yes, we do see right now, maybe when you look back in history, at least what Europe is concerned since the end of the Second World War, um, the um, strongest attack on, on the um, very foundation of Europe, um, and that is the rules-based order that was established after the Second, um, Second World War. Um, this order... Um, also within Europe, Switzerland is not member, has brought the European Union, which is also based on the rule of law and has brought the longest period of peace to the center of Europe. And this is what was intended with the OSCE. This was intended also with the United Nations that um, after the Second War, they decide that um, we um, resolve conflicts on the basis of the rule of law. And we see now, as I said, the... Um, Toughest attack on this order where we go from the rule of law to the law of the strongest. Now, the question is, um, do we accept that? And uh, we go back to a period um, um, where it is the right of, of those who have the strongest that will um, win, or do we defend the rules-based international order? And um, um, my plea, and this is, I think, why it is so important that the, commu the world community that in Europe we are united in um, um, defending this rules-based order and that we are very clear in telling Putin, in telling Russian that what he is doing um, is unacceptable and we'll fight that because we fight uh, not only for Ukraine, we fight for Europe, we fight for this rules-based order and we have to do everything 
um, to defend uh, to defend that, and therefore we have to um, also um, provide help to to Ukraine. Let me make a second point, and this is we are here at the UN. And um, we see at the UN in Geneva, I, I lived in New York at the UN for many years, and we see kind of a perception sometimes with uh, countries of the global south that they say, well, um, we are not, we are only negatively affected. This is um, the uh, prolongation of the East-West conflict, um, US against Russia. And, uh, um, you know, we are only have to pay a price in terms of energy and food. And you, you should get it over with. We don't care. We don't stand, you know, by one or the other side. And I think there, our task is that we don't only concentrate on Europe, but we send this message that we are supporting the rules-based international order, that we send this also to the global south in a competition, which becomes clearer and clearer between those countries that promote authoritarian regimes, regimes that do not um, base their politics on the UN Charter and the Universal Declaration of, of Human Rights and those who defend by this order. And this is something that we have to carry this also beyond Europe and we have to carry this to the Global South and have this discussion also um, um, at the UN in Geneva and, um, as I said, carry it to the, to the Global South. As far as the analysis of the situation is concerned, my short answer would be the global security has never been intact, but no longer it relies principally on treaties and agreements, but on interests and the limitations are obviously no longer being set by obligations, but by the available power. And as far as the conclusions are concerned, I share the positions of Christoph Heusken. Thank you so much. Yeah, what is that? <laughs> uh, I agree, uh, yes, with the Russian invasion uh, in Ukraine, basically all principles of uh, European security uh, have been broken. Those principles that uh, European states uh, have uh, themselves committed to, uh, starting with the Helsinki Final Act in 1975 uh, and reconfirmed uh, uh, through uh, many summits uh, uh, in Paris in 90, in Istanbul in 99, uh, and uh, even as uh, as recently as uh, uh, at the uh, OEC summit in, in Astana, uh, all participating states of the OEC have uh, uh, reaffirmed these commitments. They have basically all been shattered. And, and, and I think it is fair to say that definitely the last traces uh, of um, uh, cooperative security have disappeared from the European security, which is not to say that there is no European security uh, order. There is one. It is uh, dominated uh, by deterrence. Uh, it is, uh, I think, uh, it has shown, you know, how powerful um, collective security uh, as represented by NATO uh, uh, can be. Uh, but, you know, those elements that probably many of us would like to see uh, uh, elements of, of cooperative security, they have uh, totally uh, disappeared. Perhaps a, a second thought, you know, there has been this uh, talk about the, the, the Zeitenwende. I would, to an extent, agree, but I would argue it has been a Zeitenwende with Ansage. So, it it did not, you know, uh, what, what we've been seeing with the 24th of February did not come as a surprise to all those of us that have been, you know, critically observing developments uh, um, over the recent uh, one and a half decades, uh, you know, uh, in the sense that arms, arrange, uh, arms control arrangements that, you know, have provided this with relative peace and security since the end of the uh, uh, Cold War have been falling apart. 
uh, there has been uh, a, a growing polarization a again uh, uh, this uh, 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 competition between um, um, global powers no will no genuine will to really resolve um, lingering conflicts uh, and, and, and frankly, also little interest uh, and, and little investments in really safeguarding many of the multilateral institutions that uh, we have. Uh, there has been you know, a lot of uh, bilateralist approaches, transactional approaches in, in the recent uh, years. And, and, and in a way, now this has all uh, culminated uh, and, and, and somehow has been... Uh, you know, the, 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 what we saw on the 24th of February, I think, was just a negative culmination of, of quite a number of negative trends that we've been observing over recent years. Thank you so much, Ambassador Hoiskin. Germany, which has important trade ties with Russia and a post-World War II tradition of passivism, has since the Russian invasion of Ukraine pledged to revise German foreign and defense strategy. Germany has decided to triple its defense budget with Chancellor Scholz pledging 100 billion of the 2022 budget to its defense forces. He has also repeated his promise to reach 2% of the GDP spending on defense in line with NATO demands. In a reversal of previous German policies, Scholz has also supplied the Ukraine military with weaponry and deployed more forces to NATO's Eastern flank. What does this mean? for German foreign policy and Germany's position in Europe and in the world. Yes, um, I think you have described the situation quite well. And uh, Thomas Gröninger um, used the word Zeitenwender, uh, you know, a, a turning point. And this is clearly what has happened in Germany. Scholz made this speech where um, took decisions which for a long time were um, unthinkable you know, to deliver weapons in an area where there is conflict. Um, then, um, you know, over, over many years and decades um, with all conflicts, the relationship, the energy relationship with um, Russia was always kept outside and then was decided to stop Nord Stream um, 2. Also then to go to tough sanctions and, and adapt, um, you know, cut the Russian from the financial markets to SWIFT. Swift. These were all days before the 27th of February or the invasion 24th, ever said this is Im impossible. 100 million for defense. So um, this is a change and we see in the implementation that a lot is happening. We finally have armed drones, we uh, buy the F-35, um, but you do see when you look from the outside, Germany and we see you you know we read this also from um, Swiss papers East European papers saying well um, Germany may not be following through um, being reluctant on and um, this is a case um, and I think um, more has to be done and more can be done um, as an explanation, um, you know, I just um, want to turn to to repeat what um, you have said before that this was, you know, Germany has a certain history and um, this um, this history of you know trying to preserve peace, um, you know, by diplomatic means. Um, after 1989, we have cut down on our armed forces because we believed or wanted to believe that from now onwards there will be eternal peace. So. This is in the DNA of many people, and this has um, 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 Putin has thrashed this, and there are people who still have some hesitations. But there is no um, alternative. We have to assume and continue this um, this, this policy. And um, Germany is today the fourth largest economy worldwide. The um, population-wise, economy is the strongest in the European Union. Um, we are already the second largest donor to um, to the UN system. We are um, here. You have the um, humanitarian organizations. Germany is the second largest, so we are assuming responsibility. But I think we are still a bit reluctant to actually go all the way and assume what um, um, is expected from Germany. And um, you know, there, there there will be um, and there needs to be more push to do that because um, if Germany doesn't do it in Europe, who else? So. 
yes, there is this turning point, but um, one still needs to continue, push hard, and um, um, also, um, you know, have a public debate like this one here. Have it in Germany to make sure, to make clear that yes, Germany has to 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 take a leading role um, in defending what I said in my first intervention: the rules-based international order. Thank you so much, Ambassador Gramminger. In the past, neutrality was based on realism in Switzerland. Switzerland remained a strictly neutral bystander by staying out of great power competition. Today, the debate is more focused on liberalism. We discuss the Ukraine conflict based on beliefs and Switzerland is clearly supporting the Western values against Russian ones. Switzerland immediately condemned the Russian attack on Ukraine as a violation of international law. Is Switzerland able to maintain its neutrality even during Russia's disregard of national sovereignty and human rights? And what does cooperative neutrality mean? And is it viable in the current geopolitical context? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, let me, but let me start. Um, by uh, acknowledging, yes, Switzerland uh, adopted uh, comprehensively uh, the same uh, package of sanctions, continues to adopt uh, the sanctions adopted by the European uh, Union. And I think thereby shows its commitment to international law uh, and its solidarity with like-minded uh, states and, and, and organizations. This does not imply that Switzerland is fundamentally uh, questioning uh, its, its neutrality, in particular not the legal core uh, of, of neutrality. Um, now, when it comes to cooperative neutrality, this is a new term. Uh, and uh, we will have to see to what extent it is only a new term uh, and to what extent uh, its substance is also uh, different from what we know from the neutrality concept of 1993. I hope we will soon uh, learn uh, uh, more about it. To, to my knowledge, uh, the neutrality report is support, supposed to be discussed by the Federal Council this uh, Wednesday. And, and then I think we'll get a finer sense of what cooperative security stands for. My take is that it stands for well, more cooperation. Uh, um, so in a way, it calls for an active foreign policy, which is something that you know, has been uh, stated before uh, in this uh, foreign policy. Uh, but I think it also stands for more cooperation with like-minded uh, states, uh, and like-minded organizations, and including when we talk about security policy with NATO and uh, also with the European uh, Union. How far that goes, well, uh, 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 we'll see. At the same time, obviously, if you want to remain a credible neutral, if you promise uh, to engage more with the like-minded, this then kind of implies also that you do more with the non-like-minded, which again boils down to an active foreign policy. I think that's what I would dare to say at this point, but I also look forward to see this this report in the next few days. So I have a natural follow-up question to that. Is there a role for Switzerland in mediating the current crisis? And do you see the possibility of Switzerland representing Kiev's interest in Moscow? If Switzerland is no longer considered by Russia to be neutral, what is the point of neutrality? That's three different questions. <laughs> <laughs> Let me start uh, with the first one. I think let's be realistic. Uh, uh, there is, uh, uh, I think, for no governmental third party currently uh, a role of a classic mediator in the war. Uh, um, uh, against uh, uh, by Russia against Ukraine. What we see uh, uh, being done by Turkey, I think, is what I would call power mediation, which is, uh, I think, uh, in certain moments, uh, 
of a, a peace process very useful and uh, very uh, effective, but it's not what a country like Switzerland could offer anyway. So I think the short answer is no. Um, perhaps later, uh, you know, at the later stage, once there is some sort of a ceasefire peace agreement, if there is, you know, a, a resumption of uh, uh, this uh, neutrality and, and security guarantee uh, approach uh, to, to deal with the status issue, then perhaps, you know, uh, uh, Swiss expertise uh, could be uh, in, in demand. And, and of course, there is space for informal uh, platforms of dialogue. And, and, and I think this is what we here at the GCSP try to exploit. We have launched uh, an expert dialogue uh, that is very close uh, to uh, track one stakeholders on neutrality and, and security guarantees. We have a back channel. We work on the in-between states. We uh, are about to launch work on uh, joint military commissions. So we try to you know, uh, exploit the informal space. Um, U.S. Uh, uh, Switzerland representing Ukrainian interests uh, in the Russian Federation. I think it's not from now. Clearly, the Russians have said they uh, uh, don't want it. I wouldn't exclude it uh, uh, for for later, but right now, I think it would be too much of a favor uh, uh, to Ukrainians by the Russian Federation. So I'm not surprised, you know, that for the time being there is a no. Uh, your last question. Yes, there is this official uh, Russian narrative whereby Switzerland is not neutral anymore. We are uh, in this category of unfriendly uh, countries uh, now. Um, and, and at times we hear Russian officials saying they're not willing anymore to come to Geneva for uh, international negotiations, the Constitutional Committee on Syria being an example. But, but look, uh, my sense is this is... Uh, um, a policy, a narrative that is very selectively implemented, uh, uh, particularly in cases where there is no real interest to negotiate. Okay. Where there is interest to negotiate, they are still coming to Geneva and they still appreciate uh, Switzerland's role as a fair and impartial uh, facilitator. We see it in our informal processes, but you also see international uh, uh, processes We'll soon see uh, if the Russians come back for the Geneva international discussions in October. So I'm uh, uh, a lot less um, pessimistic there. Thank you so much. Um, Professor Dr. Lammert, you're going to get the question I think that is on all our minds here in Europe. In June, Chancellor Scholz said Europe stands united on the side of the Ukrainian people. He stated, we will continue to support Ukraine massively, financially, economically, humanitarianly, politically, and not least with the delivery of weapons. He continued, for as long as Ukraine needs our support. However, winter is coming and energy crisis is looming. Do you think that once the German people are forced to make stark choices between either food or heat, will they still be willing to support Ukraine? Well, I of course very much uh, hope that the still stable majority of supporting um, uh, Ukraine and the position of the German government and parliament uh, in so far will sustain, but the general experience is uh, uh, obviously that the longer a problem lasts, the more the embarrassment goes back and new priorities get room. And this is of course the sensible point for dealing with the ongoing situation and the directly and indirectly connected problems and uh, priorities. I would like to add that the often uh, uh, quoted term Zeitenwende is much more true for the actual German security policy 
as it is true for describing the changes of international global security, those changes definitely don't uh, didn't begin in February of this year, but at least uh, eight years earlier, if not uh, 14 years uh, earlier with a military intervention in uh, Georgia. But the political elites um, all over Europe, including America, have suppressed experiences with authoritarian regimes in the 20th century and have replaced reality by wishful thinking. Nevertheless, and this is part of my confidence as far as your question is concerned, after half a year of this ongoing war, we can observe at least two unintended effects, unintended as far as the Russian uh, strategy uh, is concerned. The first obvious effect is that this development has nearly completely eliminated the German preference of pacifism. There is no longer even one party addressing this position. And even the Greens, which have um, uh, campaigned uh, since 30 years uh, for a policy which should secure peace without weapons, are now formulating um, uh, positions for their party uh, conference which could uh, easily be uh, put forward on a Christian Democratic uh, Party conference. So this is one interesting uh, uh, effect. The second interesting effect is that uh, the same development has overcome the Scandinavian preference for neutrality, which is another effect with obviously consequences for the new European security uh, uh, format. By the way, my perception of the uh, um, uh, Swiss uh, neutrality is that uh, Switzerland can no longer be neutral, but it pretends to be. Um, and um, my last remark in uh, so far uh, is one of the major problems for the new German security policy is that it has even that it has generated even more expectations in our partner countries than it has generated more options for. German policy. And in so far, my perception is that in the meantime, in the last two, three months, the frustration in some partner countries of the European Union is even more uh, obvious than the uh, happiness on the Jew-German position. Thank you so much. Thank you. I am now going to ask Ambassador Hoiskin a question. I put three stars here because I think this is a big question, hopefully, and one that you will like to answer. You are going to be the new chairman of the Munich Security Conference, one of the leading conferences in the world in security policy. What are the key issues you will want to address? And what's the important, most important goal and legacy that you want to leave behind um, once you step back after your tenure as chairman? Uh, does Germany now, in its more robust foreign and defense policy um, uh, methodology, will it change the nature of the Munich Security Conference? Will you have even more power than Ambassador Ischinger? Well, um, it's a bit funny. I just started um, in February to already talk about the legacy. So uh, let's first start. But thanks for giving me an opportunity to do some PR here. Um, no, the Munich Security Conference will celebrate its 60th anniversary in um, 
in February when we have our next conference. Um, when it started, it started um, with the uh, founder who was um, Mr. von Kleist, who was in the German opposition to Hitler and who um, tried to teach the Germans something that you know we still do today and say, well, after the trauma of the Holocaust, after the trauma of the Hitler regime, you know, Germany has to assume again a role um, as partner in the NATO alliance. It was the Munich Security Conference started on a very strong transatlantic footing. We had a lot of, um, and we still have, um, American senators and congressmen who um, um, then come and and tell you know. German politicians and military at the beginning, no, you have to be a full partner in NATO. You have to assume a responsibility. There. This is how it all started over time. Um, um, my predecessors opened it up. It opened it up, up first on uh, um, uh, participants to, to Europe, um, to Europeans, but then also worldwide. We um, used to have, and we had still last time in February, just it was one week or four days before the invasion, still had Chinese there. We we tried to have uh, not only European transatlantic, and also we broadened the Topics from hardcore security. We now discuss cybersecurity, um, climate and climate change and security, health and security, um, and all the topics that are related. We have also widened it from just um, um, military and security people to um, you know NGOs and and civil society um, business. Also realizing that, for instance, when it comes to the implementation of um, you know, security issues in general, development, SDGs, you need all these actors. Um, I want to continue um, this, uh, of course. Um, there are two aspects that um, will be really important for me. Number one, I want to implement what I told you in my first response when I talked about um, that we have to get away from um, you know the narrative this is east against west I said this is about the rules-based international order we have to get the global south more involved and um, um, next year I want to put um, when we usually have you know transatlantic issues European issues on the main stage on the main day I want to get the global south on, on this get African um, leaders there because um, we just need to um, much be much more involved um, in other continents because we don't want to leave all of these continents to um, the Chinese and the and the Russians. Number one, number two, um, there is one hobby horse, so to speak, which uh, I already worked a lot on when I was German ambassador in in, in at the UN. And this is when we talk about the rules-based order, you also have to talk about the implementation of rules, the, the um, uh, subject of accountability. Um, how do you um, prevent um, um, that uh, people responsible for um, uh, war crimes, for um, uh, you know, genocide, others? How do you prevent impunity? And this is a topic I also want to put on stage because the rules-based international order will only function if um, you, 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 you have um, uh, possibilities to implement it. It is possible. We saw this in some African conflicts. We saw this that people like Mladic and uh, Milosevic had to appear in courts, but um, we have to do more on this. So these are two, two topics. Thank you so much. I'm now going to jump to, I think, what is the most important part of this import of this uh, Geneva security debate, and that is the preventing the widening of the war. And how can we put up guardrails? How can we strengthen multilateralism? And how we, can we support peace? So Ambassador Hoiskin, at the moment, there is no end in sight to the war in Ukraine. What can Germany do or Europe to bring this war to an end? Do you see any diplomatic way out for President Putin? And who can you imagine as playing a role as mediator, uh, either a person or a country? Well, um, I was um, diplomat advisor to Chancellor 
Merkel um, when the first um, Russian invasion occurred in 2014 and 15, um, when Russia invaded um, Ukraine, first Crimea, and then the Donbas in Lugansk and, and Donetsk. And uh, at the time, um, Chancellor Merkel, in the framework of the uh, Normandy format with President Hollande um, and Peter Poroshenko and President Putin, was able um, to actually stop the war, have a diplomatic uh, solution, the so-called Minsk Agreement. Um, and we worked afterwards for years very hard to implement it and to, to actually have a diplomatic solution. Now we witnessed um, um, uh, on 24th of February that Putin has decided not to pursue a diplomatic way, but uh, to go in with force. And um, um, Thomas Greminger already, already mentioned that um, Putin has violated all international agreements that there are. He has um, you know, the one agreement which in this context is very important is the so-called Budapest um, Men Memorandum from 1994, where Ukraine gave up its nuclear weapons in exchange, got a guarantee from Russia that um, they will respect the territorial integrity and sovereignty of, of Ukraine. And at the time, um, Sergei Lavrov was the UN ambassador, and he asked for this document to be registered as a document of Security Council. Why do I say this? Because when now you want a diplomatic solution, you want an agreement, you sign an agreement with Putin, nobody believes that Putin this time around will um, will agree to it. So I just at this stage don't see a diplomatic solution because Russia has um, you know, decided not to pursue this way. Um, so we are, I think right now, the best we can do is, is defend Ukraine and, and support Ukraine because they're defending um, Ukraine, they're defending the rules-based order, they defend the freedom in Europe because don't have any illusions. If Putin wins this war, if he takes Odessa or more, he will move on. He will move on and uh, uh, look at Moldova. He will move on and, and look, you know, there are some Russians from his perspective stranded in the Baltic countries. So um, we have to stop him and we have to support Ukraine. And it's for Ukraine to say, OK, this is what we want you to do. And this is how we see maybe a way out. So right now, I don't see a, a diplomatic solution and Putin doesn't seek it. You, you, you mentioned about the role of Switzerland. And uh, so therefore, we are in there. I think Putin calculates that we are weak, that um, when winter comes, when you know energy prices goes up, and then we will ask Ukraine, well, you, you rather now step back, etc. And this is a trap we must not fall in. We have to defend the international rules-based order. We have to defend the Ukrainian. You mentioned at the beginning the suffering of the Ukrainian people. I mean, you have seen European and Butcher, you, you mentioned 13 million people that had to, to leave their homes. So I think it's we have to defend Ukraine and, and um, um, see how we um, then support it and, and see what, what um, at some stage they ask us to do. Thank you so much. Ambassador Greminger, you're going to get a very difficult question um, about how can we put up guardrails? What are our safety measures designed to ensure that this conflict will not spin out of control? How can we prevent a direct confrontation between Russia and NATO? And will diplomacy and multilateralism come to our rescue? <laughs> okay, uh, again, where should I start? Uh, well, perhaps by agreeing with Christoph Holsken that indeed right now none uh, of the parties uh, seems to uh, be ready to uh, get back to the negotiation table. I think uh, both uh, sides uh, bet uh, on military wins. Uh, and, and so this famous mutually hurting stalemate, you know, that normally describes the ripeness of a conflict for resolution uh, is uh, clearly uh, not yet uh, reached. Now, how uh, to prevent uh, 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 an escalation beyond uh, the current uh, scope of the war? Well, I guess 
no direct uh, involvement uh, by uh, NATO and the West in, in the war. Uh, uh, restraint, uh, I know this is not very popular to say, but I say it anyway, restraint uh, when it comes to the type of weaponry that uh, one makes available uh, to Ukraine. Um, then uh, try to uh, maintain as many areas uh, open for dialogue and cooperation that are relevant for uh, security. Uh, political scientists call this compartmentalizing uh, security policy that is, you know, uh, uh, try to resume at some point again uh, discussions on the strategic stability agenda that is on nuclear, hypersonic, uh, non-proliferation, space, all this uh, stuff. This is all suspended for the time being. Um, same uh, when we talk about transnational threats. Um, same when we talk about challenging geographies. Uh, Iran is fortunately still ongoing. But uh, uh, when it comes to North Korea, Afghanistan, Syria, all official uh, talks are currently suspended. Um, I think in, in the medium term, it would be important to create spaces uh, for the resumption of at least some of these talks. And then, of course, uh, protecting and, and preserving multilateral uh, platforms. Uh, there is uh, the one that I worked for for a, a good decade, the OEC, I think is currently in survival mode. Um, uh, and and I think um, while the organization might right now not be particularly helpful uh, to you know manage uh, the conflict uh, to help um, getting out uh, uh, of the war, the organization still does lots of uh, very positive things for security in wider Europe, including in Central Asia. And uh, tomorrow or after tomorrow might again be very useful as a platform for dialogue. Uh, and I think uh, this is why we should do uh, our utmost uh, to, to, to preserve it. And I think uh, it would not be a good idea to kick the Russians out. Thank you so much. Ambassador Hoiskin, on the 4th of February, Presidents Putin and Xi Jinping made a joint statement, maintaining that their, and I quote, new interstate relations between Russia and China are superior to political and military alliances of the Cold War era. Friendship between the two states has no limits. There are no forbidden areas of cooperation. This is a clear announcement of a new alliance meant to go beyond the Cold War. Do you think that it will still be possible to mobilize China to deter Putin in the interest of global peace? Well, first, we must not have illusions about China when it comes to the rules-based international order, when it comes to respect to international law. Um, we see that China is also not a champion of international law. You had just last week here in uh, in Geneva, the publication of um, the budget report on the Uyghur, where it's clearly stated that um, China is in violation of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, is committing uh, crimes against uh, humanity. So it's not observing international law. Also, when you look at, um, uh, for instance, um, the South China Sea, um, China is violating international law by occupying parts of um, territory um, that clearly, according to the international law of the sea, belongs to other countries. So they don't respect international law. Um, and um, they have been very close to, to Russia. We have seen this. Um, now, um, so we don't, we must not have illusions about the nature of China. But um, we do have an indirect um, uh, possibility, and, and that is, again, coming back to what I said before, we have to work hard in the international community to um, also um, make clear that the violation of international law is something that is also worldwide objected to, and that um, Russia, but also China, get, some, um, get into some headwind, and um, so that they see that 
their reputation suffers um, when they violate international law, when they support um, Russia in particular, if Russia continues, if Russia continues to have um, these violation of human rights, etc. But um, it will not be easy, as I, as I said. Um, also, one point that maybe it's not in your, your question, but of course, China watches very carefully how the international community reacts because it has its own goals, you know, and this is um, with regard to, to Taiwan. So China um, is, is looking very carefully how we react and they will adapt their behavior. Um, um, and um, um, so this is something that is, is very, but as I said, we, we must not have um, illusions about um, um, Chinese, um, Chinese behavior. Um, there are other countries that we have look at, to look at. Um, I, we haven't mentioned India, for instance, um, soon the most um, populated country in the world, a very important uh, player um, that is, um, you know, trying to get some, you know, benefit, get some cheap oil, etc. I think also a country we have to invest in um, and um, we have to observe this, this very, very carefully for um, China also, uh, um, you know, relationship with Russia, they, they don't want to be drawn in. On the other hand, to a certain degree, they enjoy what is happening, the weakening of Russia. McCain said once in the future, I mean, the, the guy died four or five years ago, and he already said to him, stay, said, one day um, Russia will become the um, um, the 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 the, um, uh, the, Tankstelle, the, the um, the gas station of, of China. And this is, of course, something that China enjoys to have, you know, a weakened um, Russia at their, um, at their explorers. This is also something where in the long run, um, it's not in our interest to to have Russia there, but as they behave right now, I don't see an alternative to our policy. Thank you so much, Professor Dr. Lamert. Uh, what lessons should Germany and the EU learn from the crisis regarding a possible realignment of alliances? Towards whom should the EU intensify its diplomatic efforts? You have rightly quoted uh, Chancellor Scholz uh, saying that Europe stands united on the side of Ukraine. Unfortunately, if Europe would have been united in the past, the development probably wouldn't have taken place. So the most important lesson is the insight that Europe, as it still is organized politically, simply doesn't matter. So talking on diplomatic efforts, we shouldn't look for partner countries all over the world, but firstly, to the inner structure of the European Union. And um, again, unfortunately, my perception is that probably never ever there was a greater necessity for transferring national competences to European institutions in order to matter. But the preparedness to do so has never been less than it is at the moment. Thank you so much, Ambassador Greminger. Do you believe neutrality will be Ukraine's best chance for peace? What kind of neutrality will the EU and NATO membership be extended to protect Ukraine from further incursions? Can neutrality really keep Ukraine safe for the future? Well, that's a tough question after what uh, Christoph Heusken has said uh, about the Budapest Memorandum. Uh, um, but uh, look, the uh, fact is uh, neutrality and security guarantees have been negotiated in Minsk and in Istanbul uh, in uh, uh, March, early April. And uh, apparently, and if you look at the uh, Istanbul communique of the 29th of March, uh, you see that uh, the parties have come very close to an agreement uh, on an arrangement on neutrality uh, um, back then in Istanbul. Uh, at the same time, today, 
this is off the table politically uh, uh, clearly and uh, we do not know if at some point you know these issues will come back uh, um, to the negotiation uh, table uh, and it's definitely not up to us Swiss to tell the Ukrainians to become uh, neutral um, uh, having said so the status uh, uh, of Ukraine will have to be uh, somehow uh, uh, tackled, uh, dealt with, as uh, the, the status of all uh, of these in-between countries uh, that happen to be between NATO and the Russian Federation today. And, uh, and I think there have to be uh, uh, solutions that can only be achieved by dialogue, uh, and uh, frankly, I don't believe that NATO membership is the solution for these states. Uh, I think they, these bridge states should actually, these in-between states should become bridge states uh, and not be, uh, you know, uh, basically um, objects uh, of geopolitical rivalry. Now, what is the solution uh, um, for, these, uh, for this state or status challenge? Is it some sort of an unalignment? Is it neutrality, armed neutrality? Uh, what, what, that, that's definitely what we Swiss would advocate. So not defense, less, less neutrality. Uh, that perhaps is in, in the minds of, uh, of some Russians. Um, is there another way uh, to deal with this, uh, with this status issue? But it will have to be uh, solved. And this is not new. I mean, security experts have been saying so for 20 years. Uh, at the same time, there has, uh, at least uh, in the last 15 years, there has not been a serious discussion on um, the status of the bridge state. Thank you so much, Ambassador Hoiskin. Following Russia's invasion of Ukraine, Western countries imposed unprecedented economic sanctions on the Kremlin, including asset seizures, flight bans, and financial restrictions. But it is the export controls that are the untold story of the West's latest attempt to contain Russia. In a highly coordinated fashion, the U.S. and 37 other countries imposed a novel and complex regime of expert controls against Russia that re severely restrict the export of strategic technologies, including semiconductors, aircraft components, and navigation equipment, similar to the highly successful Western export restrictions that help to isolate and ultimately defeat the Soviet Union. Given time to work, do you believe that export controls will play a crucial role in undermining Russia's defense industry and eroding its military capabilities to wage the war? Um, let me go. I respond very quickly. Um, and then the time I gain, I want to come back what Thomas Gröminger said before. And the response is yes. I was myself in the 80s, um, the German deputy delegate to COCOM. This was the organization that coordinated all the embargoes, the sanctions against the Soviet Union. And I deeply believe that at least a large part of the reason why the Soviet Union fell apart was because their industry was um, was not capable in to to um, compete and uh, just they 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 just broke apart and they waited for somebody like Gorbachev that this all fell apart. So yes, they may not you know um, uh, yield the immediate result, but exactly what you mentioned with um, all the products, they will keep Russia from keeping up um you know their their industry and and their their um um and their competitiveness on um on your um remark um, um thomas um i was of your opinion for a long time in 2008 there was the nato summit in bucharest and at the time uh, president bush jr wanted to have you to give georgia and ukraine the membership action plan as kind of a precursor for NATO membership. And Chancellor Merkel, together with um, President Sarkozy at the time, vetoed it. And um, they had the general phrase, yes, one day they can become, but no membership action plan. And this is what Chancellor Merkel told Putin again and again when he was when he was talking about an you know, expansion of NATO. He said, well, there has been no expansion of NATO. The last enlargement was 2004. 
And um, we will, you know, we, we are definitely against it. There will not be um, unanimity for it, but Putin did what he did. And um, I wonder if this, after this Russian aggression, if this role of bridge um, function, bridge country, is still the concept for the future after what Russia has done to Ukraine, after the suffering 13 million people are displaced, tens of thousands killed. Can this still work or don't we, you know, at some stage have to seriously consider that everything that the Ukrainian did also defending us, you know, don't they deserve also to become under the umbrella of, of NATO and become also member of the European Union? I think I would not exclude it anymore. I think that we have to seriously discuss it when, when the time comes. Thank you so much. I have um, one more question um, that I, then I will open the floor uh, to all of you. So you will all have a chance to ask also something. So we are seeing that the US and many Europeans are sending important weaponry and funds to Ukraine. How can this go on without the West either undermining its own security needs or be being directly dragged into the war? So what will, for example, we see the high Mars and uh, the Javelin and all these weaponry now that have been sent to, to Ukraine, but it's depleting the stocks of, of the US and, and other countries. What 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 can what can we do to 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 make sure that um, countries will not stop sending weapons? It's a very tough question. Who would like to take it on? In my understanding, and it's a, it's a highly theoretical uh, concern. At the moment, we are confronted as a European Union with a principal threat to our security, but not a concrete one. Whereas in Ukraine, there is a concrete threat whether the state survives. I don't understand any speculation on the security concern of Europe instead of making whatever is possible to help Ukraine to survive. Otherwise, the theoretical or principal threat to Europe definitely would become a concrete one. Thank you so much. I had one final question. I think you wanted to answer it because you started to answer it, but I, I didn't directly ask you. So Ambassador Hoiskin, how do you think the West reaction to Russia's invasion of Ukraine could have an impact on other flashpoints like Taiwan? Yes, I think um, um, I halfway uh, answered it already. Of course, China is watching very carefully the reaction. If Russia gets away with it, um, you know, this they will also draw their conclusions. Um, you know what happened also in terms of you know the sanctions you mentioned, and uh, um, China has to consider all this. Um, the U.S. has been very clear, or um, very clear also to a certain degree, ambiguous how they will react, but. Um, no, a, a Chinese president, um, you know, for China, for, for, we have seen this for the Communist Party, for, and they are dependent on the well-being of their people. If all of a sudden, you know, they, they invade um, and then um, heavy sanctions hit them, um, how stable will the Communist Party be? So they will look at this um, uh, very carefully at the reaction. But... Um, I, I think right now they, they, they see uh, what is happening. At the same time, what I'm concerned about in China is that we see in China the same development um, as we see in Russia. What is it? This is where you have a country um, that, like in Russia, over the last years, Putin has um, basically killed all opposition. There is no free media. Um, there are no NGOs. And what do you do as a dictator, a totalitarian in particular, when the economy doesn't go well, you turn to nationalism. And we saw when, when Putin's polls were very down um, um, in 2014, he invaded Crimea and his, his uh, ratings uh, went up. So 
um, you know, I don't want to continue um, my argument, but you all follow my argument with regard to what, what may happen in China. So we have to be, um, you know, it's something that um, we have to be, we have to observe. Thank you so much. Thank you all of you for attending our third Geneva security debate. We are grateful to have had the opportunity to host this event with the Konrad Adenauer Foundation. Before I close, I would like to thank our eminent panel for their important insights on the war in Ukraine and the future global order. I wish you all a safe and peaceful evening. Thank you.